All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Paul Humus, and I'm uh, with the uh, Governor's Office in Business. In, of, sorry, Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. Thank you all for joining this webinar to learn about place-based community and economic development initiatives. This event is a soft kickoff to our regularly programmed webinar series to highlight our economic development partners' accomplishments in developing place-based strategies across the state. We at GoBiz appreciate your interest in the series, and we look forward to further, further collaborating with you all and sharing best practices within your community and within your community with public agency, economic development corporation, community business-based organization, and other partners across the state. For your awareness, this webinar is recorded and will be distributed to registrants after the event, as well as shared on the GoBiz YouTube page within the next couple of weeks. Place-based economic development strategies are initiatives to encourage economic and community development activity in defined geographic areas. Many communities have started emphasizing place-based strategies to strengthen hyper-local activities around physical place, economic conditions, and social infrastructure. Place-based economic development strategies include a variety of approaches to incentivize investment in disadvantaged communities, including funding for infrastructure and public facilities, job creation and workforce development, affordable, house, affordable and workforce housing, and more. Today, I'm happy to share updates on recent and continued work that GoBiz has done to support communities with place-based strategies and sharing best practices. Then I will turn it to our community partners with at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the City of Los Angeles, and the Sacramento Area Council of Governments to talk about place-based initiatives at the federal, local, and regional levels. To kick off this panel, I'm going to pro provide a brief overview of updates at GoBiz and how we're taking a more proactive approach in assisting agencies in economic and development projects throughout the formation of our Emerging Community and Place-Based Solutions Unit. Next, Eric Yost from HUD will provide a great background on place-based and equitable development, as well as national policy research and initiatives. Next, Vanessa Willis and Kwesi Hansels. Correct me if I, please correct me if I, I mispronounced, I'm sorry. Um, they will pre present about the Jobs and Economic Development Incentive Zones Program in the City of Los Angeles, designed to support small businesses and underserved communities. And last, Garrett Ballard Rosa, will present about the Green Means Go program, a regional initiative to catalyze infill housing development in existing communities and corridors within the Sacramento region. So um, first I want to kick off with um, some poll questions. Pardon me as I struggle through this. Um, so I want to learn a little bit more about the audience we have here. And so um, we'd like to work for, for all of you to respond to the first question, what type of organization do you represent? Whether you're a local agency, regional, economic development organization, corporation, state aid, state or federal agency, other nonprofit organization or private business. And then also in which region do you conduct most of your work? Um, that being in Redwood Coast, North State, Greater Sacramento, Bay Area, Northern, Central San Joaquin Valley and Kern Counties, Central Coast, LA and Orange Counties, Inland Empire, Southern Border, or multiple slash statewide. So I know it's quite a, quite a lot to look through. So I will give you all just a, a couple minutes to respond to that. Um, and I will finish that up in just a minute. Right, I'm going to end the poll now and share those results with you all. So many coming from local agencies, economic development organizations, or other nonprofit organizations. And we have quite a fair representation across the state. Looks like with Inland Empire leading the way. All right. Thank you all.
I'll get back to sharing my screen. So uh, first, I want to give a quick background on, about GoBiz and the GoBiz team. So as many of you are aware, GoBiz is the state's leading entity for job growth, economic development, and business assistance efforts. Our core services have included the California Business Investment Services, which provides site selection services, state incentive navigation, and under the Business Investment Services team is our permit assistance team. Other core services include California Competes Tax Credit Team, iBank, the Office of Small Business Advocate, and in recent years, GoBiz has grown to become the lead in developing emerging and sustainable industries in California, including zero market, sorry, zero emission vehicle market and infrastructure development, and energy and climate initiatives. And now, GoBiz is pleased to introduce the Community and Place-Based Solutions Unit, tasked with providing economic recovery and resiliency planning throughout the state. GoBiz's uh, Go Emerging Community and Place-Based Solutions Unit was developed in part through a U.S. EDA grant to provide COVID economic recovery planning throughout the state. Furthermore, this team will provide in-region support and the implementation of the, of the California Community Economic Resilience Fund grant program, in addition to providing ongoing community and economic development support. Our goal is to become your first stop for community and economic development questions across the state. This team will develop a more interconnected network of local practitioners that can more effectively collaborate and share local partner needs with the state and federal governments. The team comprises 13 regional representatives whose primary responsibility is to coordinate and convene region-wide economic recovery activities of stakeholders representing various levels of government and other stakeholders such as institutions of higher learning and workforce development to build regional capacity for achieving economic goals and recovery objectives. Also, this team comprises three regional managers to support the coordinators in their efforts while ensuring cross-regional collaboration between subregions to address industry sector and economic capacity needs. Furthermore, the team includes a program, super, sorry, includes a program supervisor, various technical specialists, including broadband permitting and action plan, a forthcoming tribal liaison, and myself, the place-based solution specialist. Our team is established on three core pillars of economic development. We emphasize and deploy a regions up approach, whereas we're focused on amplifying the needs of our partners. Our work is based on inclusive collaboration that maximizes community benefit, and leverages collective capacity, ensuring that underrepresented populations are active in community and economic development planning. And lastly, our goal is to align local, regional, state, and federal funding to, max to maximize local investments for sustainable, innovative projects. Though our team is in its infancy, we've been fast to provide support to local and regional efforts on significant federal grant programs, including the EDA's Regional Build Back Better Challenge, Good Jobs Challenge, the National Science Foundation Regional Innovation Engines, NIH's ARPA-H program, DOD's Defense, Manu Defense Manufacturing, Manufacturing Support Program, and much of our efforts will continue to align local and regional priorities to help them secure IIJA um, funds. As demonstrated by this brief list, we support a wide range of community development and industry priorities pulling in local and regional agencies, academic institutions, economic development organizations, and private employers. Through our statewide coalition building, we aim to align inter and intra-regional efforts with state and federal priorities to help them secure funds to accomplish community and industry projects. And each of our regional coordinators is assuming a community development topic to identify local and regional best practices and spread awareness of state and federal grants in their respective subject. As shown, we'll provide technical support, investment priority alignment, and assist in identifying funding opportunities in these respective subjects. And as we embark on these expanded services, GoBiz is happy to launch a new website dedicated to assisting our partners with economic development, recovery, and readiness, 
I encourage you all to visit our new website shown here where you can find economic and community development resources for major state funding programs, place-based strategies, identify relevant federal, state, and regional agencies, as well as funding opportunities to, based on community development priorities. In addition, uh, we'll highlight regional initiatives and we'll continue adding more content in the new year. Also, our community and place-based, um, we've been working with GIS planning. Sorry, I'm gonna switch over to open something different. We've been working with um, a firm GIS planning to launch a community and place-based uh, tool to help our local partners um, in putting pulling together fast socioeconomic um, and socio socioeconomic and demographic data to support plan development, such as uh, investment prospectuses and playbooks. Here's just a sneak peek. I, I selected the city of Albany. You can explore communities at the city, county, and regional level, pulling together various um, indicators or metrics so that you can use this information and content to put together very quick, um, as well as quick and attractive um, graphics and st statistics for some of your um, analyses and playbooks. Let me get back to share my screen. And so I would like to conclude my portion of this presentation um, and in the future would love to showcase place-based and regional initiatives. And also we're here to support your efforts um, as we're as we move into the future in this program. Um, would love to highlight and demonstrate some of the programs and projects at your regional level. Um, we look forward to continuing our collaboration with you all. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Eric Yost of HUD, um, and he is going to present on federal place-based initiatives, um, as well as what he has going on with um, policy research. Thank you so much, Mark, and thank you to all of you um, out there today that are working so diligently on place-based um, approaches and place-based activities. I'm, I'm excited to present for, for several different reasons. Um, this is my passion is place-based work and I'm very fortunate to be um, have the opportunity to be involved in the development of and currently in the development of um, several new federal place-based initiatives in support of that effort. I am based in our office of the DAS or the office of the Deputy Assistant Secretary for um, economic development. So we actually have an economic development office at HUD. Um, in our department, we actually have two um, specific departments. We have an office of economic development and an office of rural housing and economic development. And this has been the home for many of the historical federal place-based initiatives, like um, the Partnership for Sustainable Communities, Strong Cities, Strong Communities, Prama Zones, and um, supporting uh, many other efforts um, and is currently the innovation office for some newer place-based initiatives that are in development that I would like to share with all of you. So first, I wanted to just kind of go over a few things that I wanted to set a framework. Um, you know, it's really interesting for those that are engaged in this world to understand some key terms and definitions. And then I want to actually go from the kind of big picture macro from the international space down to kind of a national look of what's happening and then down to kind of some key activities that uh, our department at HUD is working on in collaboration with some other federal agencies around the key areas that Mark had discussed and our participants and presenters will also be uh, discussing as well. So I know many, when we talk about place-based, it's always interesting that I, you know, when I hear this term, because I always feel like it's a descriptor, right? It's a descriptor of a program. It could be a place-based grant. I've heard place-based economic development, place-based community development, place-based de development, there's place-based policies. How do we talk a lot about our place-based approach to the work we do? There's place-based in, in intervention, strategies, impact investing, and place-based initiatives. And so when you're having those discussions, a lot in the industry tend to group them all as one. But they all are distinct and different on what you're talking about. And sometimes you can have that broader term around those. So I think it's important to always keep that in mind when you're thinking through how you're going to develop and, and discuss place-based activities. A um, couple of things that I wanted to share is they're actually... Um, 
has been a lot of research recently around um, equitable community economic development. Um, a lot about indicators, a lot about kind of how to define the term um, from a variety of our uh, think tanks and policy um, providers across the country, from the American Institute of Architects to you know our city partners up in Seattle to GAR and PolicyLink and many others you can see on this list. And so even at HUD, we're reflecting on these many different um, tools and resources that are available around how to define equitable development as we're developing new policies and programs, not only just within HUD, but actually across our federal um, agencies and partners. You know, one of the common definitions that I like to say is, is and, and everyone, again, it's always important to come up with it when you're talking about equitable development, but uh, Car Carlton Eli, who's um, wrote a book back in, in an article back in 2009 and 2010, probably has one of the more, more clear definitions of equitable development, although I think it needs can, can be very defined in a local context because each local community can define what that means to them. And this is just a, a definition that I'm using for purposes of to share as an approach to meet the needs of underserved communities and individuals throughout projects, programs, and our policies that reduce disparities while fostering places that are healthy, vibrant, and diverse. And even my federal partners at EPA have taken and closely follow that definition and some of the way they define that. But there's this always ongoing discussion of how do you define equitable development as similar to place-based policies. You know, we're not alone in this work. Um, you know, I always share when we're discussing policies, especially um, being a career staff person and changes administrations, that there are other countries in the world that are also studying this um, and in their communities as well. So I just wanted to reference two, two um, particular places, um, New Zealand and Australia, that are also creating different research um, publications around how to evaluate outcomes in place-based initiatives, how to develop frameworks or policy approaches um, for um, place-based initiatives and um, two excellent examples of some of the work. The team from um, Australia actually came out to Los Angeles a few years ago and visited with many of those um, in the city and in the community to hear and learn more about it. So I was honored to, to meet many of the team that's working on their federal policy in New Zealand and Australia. In addition, there's um, been a, quite a lot of research, especially since the new administration came in, um, about what does place-based policies look like? What could they look like? And reflecting on prior place-based policies on this federal level, um, also focus on kind of both um, state levels and local, but I'm gonna really more discuss on the federal level. So our, our friends at both PolicyLink Blue Meridian Partners and Urban Institute have written a series of publications starting back in June 2021 um, about designing the next generation of federal place-based policies, kind of looking back at historical policies and programs, looking at the assumptions behind these programs, and then creating a blueprint for this next generation that could be used um, both for our federal policy, but can be used in state and local. In addition, some key blueprints were created early in 2022 when there were some key initiatives that were going through um, either federal appropriations, bipartisan infrastructure law, or Build Back Better Act. And so you'll see some of these blueprints around affirm affirmatively furthering fair housing, which is very appropriate to HUD. Um, the Community Restoration and Revitalization Fund, which was something our department was working on at HUD, which is part of Build Back Better Act. Um, that did, of course, um, was stalled. But then you also have promised neighborhoods, which we have many in California, and of course, transportation, as Mark had mentioned. Other efforts has been looking at kind of these historical places, looking at the long-term impact of evaluation of these comprehensive community initiatives. And so the Urban Institute has also reflected on three key community initiatives, both in Atlanta's East Lake, the East Baltimore Development Initiative, and then of course, um, the excellent work being done down in San Diego City Heights Initiative. And I think these both provide some really good examples of how to take a look at whether or not the work is comprehensive or not, and how the long-term view of this uh, place-based policies may work. In addition, in January of um, this year, um, both the Urban Institute um, published two other um, publications. One is charting out a next generation for federal place-based transportation policy, obviously, knowing with bipartisan infrastructure law, but also about more equitable and sustainable mobility. And then the final one that I wanted to reference is why process matters, how you achieve equity goals as part of an inclusive economic development and betting it into the plans for growth. So these research papers are really important. Um, I think that also help us in the federal government to define and look at the ways we might want to revise these policies. 
you know, this this is a, a I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but this is from the designing the next generation of place based policies. And what I wanted to hold out from this is the beginning, the place matters, and you know, the end, which is the federal government can play a role that's central to catalyzing and supporting reparative work in communities, but it's usually in partnership and it has to always be in partnership with local and state government, regional co coalitions and the philanthropy. So we can play a central role, but we're not the only one that plays that role. And so it's so great to have the others on the, on the call here as well. In addition, in the examining the assumptions behind place-based programs, um, Brett Theodos, who um, writes a lot of the, the publications and research for Urban Institute, talks about Homer's odyssey and this, this dangerous place between um, two sea monsters when you're crossing the Strait of Messina and how place-based revitalization is kind of similar to that work because you're facing two really these opposing pitfalls. On one hand, you're trying to do an initiative that might do little to alter the status quo, leaving the neighborhood as impoverished when they began. You know, and so what do you have? You have, you know, continuation of insults of broken promises and lack of trust and, you know, sense of intractability. And then on the other hand, you might have too much going on and proving a neighborhood to the point where it could lead to interests that crowd out the people that you were trying to benefit. And so it's always kind of that careful balance to doing this work and, and as we're thinking about federal policy. These are complex and complex work. And I think it takes the power of everyone together to do this work. And in social science policy, you know, it can become some of the most complex to evaluate. And because there's such a multi-component intervention strategy, um, some of the recent research by the Urban Institute shared that, you know, in previously, many of these efforts were envisioned to take five or 10 years to do really that comprehensive um, efforts in communities. And they're starting to think now that it takes longer, 10 years or longer. It's a true commitment to, to neighborhoods and in excesses of over 500 million up to even 3 billion to really do the effort that is envisioned that many want to do. And so this does pose a lot of challenges for evaluating, but it also poses challenges as policy makers for how do we sustain that effort, keep it going, continue to learn about it, and ensure that we educate those that are involved or wanting to know about this work of how important the local level can be and the local partners to, to, to share that information and then how you can leverage the funding as market shared. So where are we in the federal government right now? So we have several place-based initiatives and I'm not gonna talk about all of them. There are two that are continuing through actually three administrations, which have been quite amazing, which is the Urban Waters Federal Partnership and Promazones. And we have four Promazones in California, in Sacramento, San Diego, South Los Angeles, Slate Z, and the Central Los Angeles and the Los Angeles Promazone. And I know some of my HUD colleagues in both the San Francisco Regional Office and Los Angeles Field Office are on the line, and I wanted to thank them for their support of that work, um, whether Promazones or Urban Waters Federal Partnership. On the federal side, and those are federal interagency place-based initiatives, there's several new ones, and I'm only going to talk about a couple of them, but one is energy communities through the Department of Energy, and one that's growing pretty rapidly is the Rural Partners Network, and I'll share more about that. And there's several others that are under development right now um, in this uh, segment of the administration. So what is the Rural Partners Network? Um, first of all, it's actually a response to creating place-based initiatives by bringing together um, several federal agencies, as you can see here, um, around community networks that are developed for neighborhood revitalization. We've issued a new website called rural.gov that not only talks about this partnership network, but also talks about and shares information about general help for rural communities. And so what's HUD's role in this? Um, and I'll share a little bit more about that as one of the partners in the Rural Partners Network. Um, this effort was launched in April, 2020, and there's a fact sheet on rural.gov that shares a lot about the information about the Rural Partners Network and how to support place-based work in rural communities. It has a, both a depth and a breadth strategy. So this is something that I find is new and unique to a lot of the work we're doing in place-based works in the federal government. And this language is continuing throughout the development of new initiatives is not only are we looking at these places that we can learn from and really lift up as pilots, hence why they have a depth strategy with the Rural Partners Network, but there's also a breadth strategy, knowing that we have to scale things, we wanna learn, create communities of practice, such as this one on this call to share what's been happening. And so these are the first initial states both in the spring and the fall, that the Rural Partners Network has named a series of community networks or place-based initiatives to pilot. Um, the plan is to scale this throughout the country over the term of the administration, but these are just the initial ones for 2020. 
And so what does that look like? These are the community networks that have been selected in the states across the country and or tribal areas or in US territory in Puerto Rico. And so you can see these are coalitions of partners that have come together to do work on comprehensive economic and community development. So where does HUD fit into all this and where are we going with our work? Because many agencies lead that effort. Obviously USDA leads that effort, but HUD is a partner in collaboration with the White House Domestic Policy Council. So in HUD, we have several key, um, what I call community plans. So one is our equity action plan. Um, and that's focused on procurement, fair housing and civil rights, and home ownership and homelessness. We have our strategic plan with five strategic goals and 15 strategic objectives. And then we have an annual performance plan. Of course, this covers our period of October 1st through September 30th. And there's some overarching priorities and, and um, strategic objectives with milestones and et cetera, like you'd see commonly in strategic plans. But how does that relate to place-based work? I'll tell you in a, in a moment here. Another key document that we are kind of highlighting a lot at HUD is our government-wide housing supply action plan that the White House announced in May of this year, in addition to in August or October, um, a progress report on that that came with a new quick guide tool to using HUD's community development programs, our CPD programs, for increasing the supply of affordable housing. And so what can that look like and how can that be leveraged? Again, it's one policy area and your place-based efforts. So in our strategic plan, we have four key goals. I wanted to focus on strategic goal one, which is to support underserved communities and diving deeper into strategic objective 1C, which is to invest in the success of our communities. And so what does that look like? That's where um, my team and others throughout HUD are leading this effort to promote equitable community development that generates wealth building for underserved communities, particularly communities of color. And that 1C is what's really critical to this discussion and what's built into that. Um, around that, we have two key things. One is to foster existing place-based initiatives and programs and then create new place-based initiatives. And then the second is to really invest catalytic resources focused on equity and community wealth building for that community and neighborhood revitalization. So with that comes a series of activities we're doing at HUD. I'm not going to read through all these, but I'll highlight a couple of them. Um, one is we are participating in a White House Domestic Policy Council Urban Equitable Development Interagency Policy Committee that's looking at these definitions of equitable development and looking at what that means across the federal government. In addition, um, we're looking at our language at HUD related to economic development and investments in people and places to see where it could have adverse effects on um, communities that we did not intend that language to look like. We're also working on new MOUs with our other federal partners that are underway. And again, we're supporting the Rural Partners Network, as I mentioned um, earlier. So what is this support for Rural Partners Network? I thought this might be kind of interesting to share with all of you, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up here and turn it over to our um, state and, and city colleagues here. So what HUD decided was that in supporting rural communities, we needed to look at it from a different angle. And we realized that the way we support place-based work had to take on a very different approach. And so and this is kind of a newer thing we've done at HUD is we actually formed a Rural Prosperity Coordinating Council. And this Rural Prosperity Coordinating Council includes mostly members of career staff and some political appointees. Um, and it's really to support our rural strategy um, across HUD, but also support this Rural Partners Network that is this place-based um, initiative for rural communities. So we have 15 HUD departments on our Rural Prosperity Coordinating Council with 34 HUD staff that are serving to align these resources. And what this looks like is doing listening sessions, defining and analyzing language about rural communities, coordinating with the White House Rural Prosperity Interagency Policy Committee, and with the Rural Partners Network, and learning how to build more capacity around HUD's resources and what those look like. And so obviously, we've seen a lot of research recently around rural prosperity, from equitable development in smaller cities, to capturing impact of investments in rural, to redefining rural, um, and um, partners at the Federal Reserve and in investing in rural prosperity. So this gives us a chance at HUD to leverage and, and, and those across the state of California that work in rural communities can leverage our HUD exchange website where we have a rural gateway, where we have peer-to-peer -peer learning and resource sharing. We have different initiatives that we feature, many of the place-based initiatives that I talked about and didn't get a chance to talk about. We have um, case studies, webinars, 
And we have something that's really useful, which is an on-the-call technical assistance for communities um, that they can participate in to learn more about how to leverage HUD and other federal resources for rural communities. So there are three key websites at HUD. HUD.gov, which is our big public-facing website. HUD user, which is more of our policy development and research team. And then this HUD exchange that I'm talking about. HUD exchange is really where we do a lot of our technical assistance for communities, place-based initiatives, place-based community and economic development. And there are three key um, technical assistance that I wanted to share with all of you. One is, you know, communities may not know this, but you can request direct technical assistance from HUD for planning efforts around um, if you're a HUD grantee. You work with your local office, so you'd work with the local uh, office either in Santa Ana, our local HUD office in Los Angeles, or in our HUD regional office in San Francisco. We also have a distressed cities technical assistance that I know many in California and in the state have participated in. And then again, here's this information about our rural gateway for those that are working in smaller communities. So what's happening now? So basically at HUD, we've been charged with and I'm really excited for hearing what Mark said. We've been charged with creating this place-based learning community. So looking at a place-based library, gathering all the data and research we know about place-based work that's happened over the years in the federal government because as new administrations come in, it's like relearning it and where can we warehouse all that information. We're creating learning cohorts so people can learn more about what this has done. And then we're developing a framework for how to design these new initiatives and moving forward. Two last things that I wanna share with you is our collaboration with the Department of Transportation around thriving communities. You may have heard about that where DOT through appropriations, not for from bipartisan infrastructure law, but from appropriations received 25 million, HUD received 5 million, two different programs with the common theme of thriving communities, which you can see here what the goal is around community driven transportation and revitalization activities. And what we recently have done and the goals of this initiative are common across both agencies is that each agency issued notice of funding opportunities and we're currently in the process of reviewing applications to select capacity builders, providers that will provide the technical assistance, DOT at the same time did a request to have communities apply for theirs. HUD will be releasing our process to apply for this technical assistance later. Um, so stay tuned and I'll make sure I share with Mark uh, that information. But ours is gonna be really focused on TA to help local governments around housing, economic development, local economic development ecosystems, um, and much of what you'll hear about today. Um, DOTs is split up into three uh, TA cohorts, a Main Street cohort, complete neighborhoods and the network communities. Um, and again, it's the focus is on these partnerships and what place-based work is about. Um, lastly, I just wanted to share two, two um, key tidbits around our department's work with what many of you know as community project funding or economic development initiatives, or um, I'm gonna point to my ear because um, some people might call them something related to my ear. Um, so our department manages the $1.5 billion portfolio of um, over a thousand grants that were um, selected by Congress for economic development projects. Um, about 152 million is in California. The average size is about a million and there's 125 um, in California. We were anticipating that that number may be 1600 for this fiscal year as soon as the budget's passed and that number may be 3 billion instead of 1.5 billion. So it's a big growing part of our work is to ensure that we're working with our congressional leaders and local um, organizations around the community economic development initiatives or community project funding. So lastly, I just wanted to share some stuff about opportunity zones. I know that's not the focus of this, but I could didn't want to be remiss about sharing some current data. So Nova Gradic recently released their investment report. Interestingly, you know, they track about a third of the funds et cetera, or a quarter of the funds, and they're showing at about 32 billion that has been invested. What's interesting is if you triple that, you're at about 100 billion, which is what was anticipated with the Opportunity Zone. So, and we're still very early in the initiative. Still big focus on housing, which is good for those of us that work in the housing world and or um, broader commercial efforts. Um, and there's a pickup in operating businesses, but still there, the data is kind of looking like it's lagging, but that's primarily because a lot of that is not being reported to Novogratic, but about 10 billion this year. Um, and what have we learned from that? We've learned, as Mark had shared, that investment prospectuses were really important to opportunity zones. 
But now we're seeing investment playbooks are really critical. So our partners at Drexel University and NOAC Metro Finance Lab and throughout the state of California, the country have been developing these really critical investment playbooks that are looking at how to leverage in, in place all the federal funding that's come through ARPA, through bipartisan infrastructure law for from the Inflation Reduction Act and bring all those partners together for that work. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Mark and uh, thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you so much, Eric. I um, especially appreciate the highlight of the rural programs that you have. Um, some of the speakers that I'll be presenting uh, their programs are more urbanized environments, urban or suburban environments. So I uh, appreciate the, uh, the the highlight of that. And in future um, iterations of this webinar, would love for um, some best practices uh, at, at amongst our partners um, in rural economic development. Um, where I want to uh, go into next uh, will, will be a highlight of a city-led program. Often what I get, um, you know, asked of me in my role as a place-based solution specialist are what can cities do to help leverage various designations that are, that are uh, federal or state-led. And so the city of LA, they developed the JEDI zones in which they are leveraging designations, federal designations, such as opportunity zones and promise zones to create an overlay to help small businesses, to support small businesses. So um, I will, I'm happy to, to hand this over to Vanessa and to Kwesi um, for you all to uh, explain more about your program. Um, and hopefully some of our partners that are on this call uh, can gain some insights and some best practices for uh, similar program development. Thank Good you, afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Vanessa Willis. I'm a senior management analyst with the city of Los Angeles. Specifically, I work in the economic and workforce development department. And my colleague here, Kwesi Hansels, he's going to um, take over the presentation. I want to give you guys a little bit of background, and then he's going to give you the nuts and the bolts, and he get and he gets the really cool part of the presentation after um, I I go through the the housekeeping <laughs> portion. So I'm going to share my screen. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yes, it's yes, the right do. screen. Okay. Yes. So I'm here today to talk about the JEDI zones, um, and that stands for Jobs and Economic Development Incentive Zones. I can't take credit for that awesome name. That um, familiar name was actually gifted to us from C City Council. Um, so when we were asked, the um, Department of Economic and Workforce Development was asked to create a um, a, a program, uh, the, as a matter of fact, the city's first targeted place-based program, um, they told us that it was called the JEDI Zones, and they told us that um, they wanted it to create jobs and support small business to sustainability. That's about all of the information that our department had to go on. Um, so we started off by researching similar mun municipalities around the country and what incentives they were um, offering and what, what was working for them. And the only real data that we had to back up or to justify um, whether a, a an incentive was working or not working was its sustainability. How long had it been offered? Was it a continuing program? So um, there were several successful um, models for us to use. Um, we also used existing data um, that was developed um, by small businesses who were coming to our department for help. We um, would um, record those challenges that they were faced with and um, we de we decided to include in our incentives solutions to those challenges. Um, so our department took all of these proposed incentives, including, you know, um, like tax breaks and, um, you know, grants and all of these really um, ideal incentives that we wanted to offer. We took them to legal and legal taught us we couldn't do any of that. Um, and they were concerned that there was no, they were concerned about our basis for differentiating 
where we were going to provide these enhanced in services and incentives and not providing it to the, these businesses, their, their neighbors. So we decided as part of the JEDI Zones policy to um, ju justify providing enhanced services and incentives by using um, overlays. So we took areas like the opportunity zones, the promise zones, um, former community redevelopment areas. And we used those areas as the basis of our policy. And that enabled us to say, these zones need special attention. They have been designated as opportunity zones. They have been designated as promise zones. And therefore there is a basis to say that they do need these enhanced services. So um, once we had that justification, we um, created a policy that allowed us to overlay the JEDI zones um, and create incentives that legal would allow us to create. Now, Quasi is going to get into the nuts and bolts of the policy and the benefits of the JEDI zones. Um, Mm -hmm. I just wanted to provide that background since I actually was around, a, a, I've been around a little bit longer than Quasi has. And, um, you know, he was less familiar with the background aspect of it. So at, with that, I'll turn it over to Quasi and let him um, continue with the presentation. Thank you, Vanessa. And uh, thank you, Mark. Um, I guess I can introduce myself again. My name is Quasi Hansels. I'm a management analyst with the city of Los Angeles, uh, working in the economic workforce development, uh, yeah, economic workforce development department. I'm sorry, I don't know how I forgot that. I mean, I'm primarily a program manager for this Jedi Zone program. Um, so uh, Vanessa provided a lot of good background information on um, basically how they were able to come up with the policy that was eventually established, um, but just, as an overview, this policy um, is basically being brought to the businesses in these misrepresented areas um, to be able to offer resources and incentives uh, that city programs and city departments offer to these businesses at more of a, a high frequency rate, uh, streamlining these services uh, and making sure that these resources are kind of just in the forefront and in their face. Um, can we go to the next slide? So um, just some quick background on the process of how a JEDI zone um, is approved. Um, so first, uh, a city council district actually proposes an area based off of the uh, primary criteria that they have. Uh, Vanessa mentioned some of the things uh, such as being in an opportunity zone, uh, being in a promise zone, um, also being a part of our, our comprehensive economic uh, development strategy. Um, is also considered as a primary uh, qualification. Um, but after that, the uh, basically the council district uh, introduces that motion. Um, and then it is on our team, the Economic Workforce Development Department, um, to actually evaluate the area uh, and make our recommendations. Um, when we do those evaluations, uh, we use various tools, uh, such as programs like My Sidewalk, um, ArcGIS, um, Zemus to be able to, to pull data on that specific proposed area uh, within those boundaries of the area, I mean, um, and basically come up with a recommendation uh, for if that area should be approved or not, or if a portion of that area should be approved. Um, from there, our recommendation is provided to city council and the mayor's office um, for approval. If approved, um, the area is then appointed a program manager such as myself, uh, from there, the program manager uh, starts to conduct outreach uh, in the uh, approved area, uh, and then eventually with the end goal being the businesses benefiting from the services that are coordinated uh, by that program manager. Sorry, could you move to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, so our establishment policy, um, Vanessa touched on a lot of that, uh, basically how it was approved. Uh, and I kind of gave you a little bit of a background on, on why uh, this program was established. Um, but let's hop into the next slide where we can look at the eligibility criteria. Uh, so we have our primary qualifying criteria. Uh, and then you'll notice uh, as I get to the end that 
if the uh, when the businesses or I mean I'm sorry when an area meets uh, one of these primary qualifying criteria, we then evaluate them on the secondary qualifying criteria. Uh, so the primary qualifying criteria are being within a federally designated opportunity zone, uh, being in a designated promise zone community, uh, a city established EIFD district, um, a city established CRIA district. Um, in a focus area designated in the citywide economic development strategy, as I mentioned before. Uh, and then if they meet one of those, or uh, if they uh, meet four of the secondary uh, qualifying criteria, um, we still, we, we uh, basically go on and uh, do an evaluation of the secondary criteria for those areas, uh, regardless of if they meet one of the uh, primary qualified criteria but we also um, consider those areas that don't meet one of the qualifying criteria to, to see if they can meet four of the secondary needs uh, criteria. So, so the next slide, please. Yes. Um, so here are our secondary needs uh, criteria that we do an assessment on for each of these individual areas. Um, one of the things that we look at in these misrepresented areas are if the uh, area qualifies for low and moderate income, um, as defined by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So um, Eric was already speaking for us, but uh, um, basically if the, the area has at least 51% of its residents being uh, of lower moderate income persons. Um, next, uh, the average unemployment rate uh, that is at least 3% uh, higher than the citywide average. Um, I believe that our citywide average right now is uh, 6%. Unemployment rate, um, of course, has been higher since COVID. Um, but uh, so basically, any uh, any area that would actually be at nine percent or higher would qualify for this uh, um, criteria. Uh, next, um, the next criteria is is based off of blight. So uh, deteriorated commercial structures um, or the deterioration of just buildings as a whole or storefronts as a whole, uh, abandoned or vacant properties. Um, high turnover rates, so businesses moving in and out of the area um, on these industrial building and commercial buildings. Um, a low, a normally low property value rates uh, that we, we um, use data from CoStar to be able to determine. Um, so this more so criteria more so is uh, more of a visual assessment. Um, you're not able to necessarily determine that without going to the actual area. So within our um, our evaluation, we actually do this visual assessment as well to make to see if the uh, the area qualifies for this specific criteria. Um, next uh, would be more than 50% of the buildings in the area are zoned for commercial or retail usage. Uh, so of course, the point of this is we're trying to help out businesses primarily. So we wanna make sure that most of these areas or the areas that we are chosen or we recommend for approved Jedi zones uh, aren't highly residential and are, are mainly um, housing businesses or, um, or inhabiting businesses. Um, next one would be uh, the area contains at least one city priority project, uh, which is defined at the time of the Jedi Zone is created. Uh, so we use um, data that we receive from the, uh, the city council districts um, to be able to determine if, there's, if this is a, or if any of the uh, proposed areas are within a, um, a city priority project. Uh, which they usually are because the council district area is uh, proposing these areas. Uh, and last, um, the last criteria that we use to be able to um, identify if this area can uh, meet the requirements to being a Jedi zone is if it's within a boundary of a community redevelopment area that was active at the time of the dissolution of the community redevelopment agency of the city of Los Angeles. So we pull this data as well. Um, from Zemus and also from my sidewalk um, to be able to determine if this uh, criteria is met. Um, so this is a little small, but uh, right now this is um, this is a list or uh, a picture of all of our approved Jedi zones. So we currently have eight approved Jedi zones um, dating back to uh, where the program just began in July of, the, of 2022. Uh, so. Uh, all of these areas, as you can see, um, they have been approved. They weren't necessarily all or exactly what was re what was uh, proposed by the council district, um, but by uh, pulling all of the data that we were we were able to pull from our, our various resources um, and being able to uh, exemplify 
that they qualify or these specific or specific areas within the proposed uh, zones will qualify, um, we are able to get these areas approved by council and the mayor's office. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so here's more so the bread and butter or what matters to uh, the businesses, uh, which are the incentives that we offer businesses that are located in these areas. Um, I just want to make sure it's a question that we kind of get often, um, and I want to make sure that I outline this, but even though it's the Jedi zones, businesses are not able to receive lightsabers. We don't have uh, that technology at our hands, so um, just wanted to make sure I made that clear. But uh, <laughs> the first uh, incentive that I want to get into is our, um, our priority support program. So within this incentive, uh, we make sure to uh, have the business fill out a survey that gives us foundational information on some of their needs uh, pertaining to, of course, the incentives that we're able to offer. Uh, and from there, we're able to make a customized action plan for each individual business um, so that we can help them meet their goals and provide them with the resources that we have um, at our fingertips. Um, next is going to be the, uh, the, develop, uh, the development support incentive. So uh, this incentive is really key to businesses looking to uh, do some type of construction, redevelopment, um, or renovations on their property. Uh, we know that uh, as a business, they're, they're constantly focused on how their business is running and making sure that it is running well. Um, and it gets very time consuming dealing with a lot of uh, city departments. Um, so we are basically have relationships with the, in, with individuals in our different city departments to be able to streamline and more so guide these businesses through any of these processes uh, to make sure that they're able to uh, get them done as soon as possible so that their business can be operating at its highest capacity. Um, the next incentive, which is very popular, uh, is our fee reduction for development permits. Um, so money was set aside. Uh, I believe they're funds from ARPA, right, Vanessa, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, so our funds were set aside um, and given to our, our building and safety and planning departments with the city of Los Angeles, uh, where we're able to offer a $10,000 fee reduction off of an invoice for businesses that are pulling permits for any renovations um, or uh, any construction that they're doing. I'm sorry, my computer glitched. Uh, but for uh, any, any uh, renovation or any construction that they're doing, um, even if they're just doing something as simple as a change of use, uh, you have to be able to pull a permit. So um, as we know, those things can get pretty costly for a business owner. So we want to be able to provide some relief in that sense. And uh, we've developed a process that's made it as easy as they're able to take the certificate up to the counter as they're paying for their invoice. And the uh, the amount of money, uh, the, the up to $10,000 is deducted uh, off of that invoice uh, for that transaction. Um, the next incentive that I would like to touch on is our microloan program. Uh, so the microloan program is already offered by the city of Los Angeles uh, for micro enterprises, small businesses, um, as long as the business has, does not gross over a million dollars in revenue in a year. Um, but this program of course has already has interest rates and application fees associated with it. So uh, if a business is, is uh, located in our Jedi zones, um, that application fee is now being waived um, and the interest rate is, in re is also reduced uh, to prime competitive rates with the market. Um, so making it a little bit easier for these businesses to get access to some type of capital um, and uh, to be able to either expand or just make sure that they're able to uh, sustain what, uh, their current business where it's at. Uh, the next incentive, which is the most popular one for sure, uh, is our facade improvement program, uh, where uh, is the incentive is more so based on storefront or, or businesses being able to improve uh, the appearance of their storefront, therefore to attract more foot traffic to these uh, misrepresented areas uh, and attract more business or more consumers to these businesses. Um, so with this program, just to give a little bit of background on it, we're actually able to provide the businesses with a forgivable, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a grant or a forgivable loan uh, up to $75,000 for their storefront for light facade improvement. So things including like uh, graffiti removal, um, painting, uh, new signage, uh, new windows, new doors, fencing, lighting, et cetera. 
um, to be able to make it, like I said, more inviting uh, for those consumers that are walking around in these areas. Um, the next uh, incentive is our employer connection incentive, uh, where we're, we were able to identify in our research when establishing the policy that businesses have a lot of high turnover with employees, uh, and basically being able to hire um, can be more of a challenge for some business owners. Um, and so with this incentive, we partner with our WorkSource Center uh, to be able to provide qualified candidates uh, for our businesses, help them with the, um, the vetting process of candidates, uh, help them uh, be able to identify ideal candidates or where to advertise to uh, obtain those ideal candidates, um, and also um, offer the incentive of being able to help them advertise their jobs uh, to uh, areas where they might not have been able to reach before. Um, the next incentive is our compliance assistance incentive, um, where similar to the development support incentive, um, we have identified through our research that it's difficult for businesses to be able to navigate through the different city departments to get uh, what they need approved or maybe to be within code or maybe to make sure that they're not violating any uh, regulations. Um, so. Uh, with this incentive specifically, we work again with our, our city uh, colleagues um, in different departments uh, to be able to streamline um, any processes that may need to be streamlined and also uh, more so um, keep these businesses on track or within compliance uh, by providing them timelines um, and also step-by-step -step procedures or how to make sure that they're in compliance with any codes that they might be violating. And last but not least, uh, the, the incentive that we offer to businesses that they're very interested in as well is access to capital. Um, so we partner with our business source centers in the city of Los Angeles um, to, all, to, to, to also partner with their partners um, in terms of lenders uh, from different financial uh, entities around the city of Los Angeles who are specifically interested in investing in specific industries or specific areas. Uh, to help provide these businesses with different funding opportunities um, so they'll be able to do things like expand or take care of uh, or, or have more working capital um, or be able to sustain where they at or where they are at currently. Um, so that covers uh, the incentives that we offer with this program. Next slide. So just a little bit of overview on uh, some of the monies that are provided for the program. Uh, so the funding to provide these incentives and services and resources for the Jedi Zone program um, is at 7.5 million currently right now. Um, and that breakdown goes as $4 million for facade improvement projects. Uh, 2.5 million has been designated uh, throughout the different areas for permits. Um, as I mentioned, up to $10,000 per business for those uh, that permit reduction fee. Um, and then 1 million for upgrading business technology needs. Uh, and that more so is going to go into as we're uh, developing these relationships with these businesses that are enrolled in the program, um, being able to identify where technology can actually help them um, maybe turn a curve or just benefit their business um, as a whole. So we have different programs that we're uh, partnering with, um, such as uh, our LA Optimize program, where uh, it's based on uh, developing web pages uh, and social media traffic for businesses. Um, and also e-commerce opportunities for businesses. Uh, and then we're also working uh, to possibly partner with different entities to provide POS systems um, to these businesses uh, to make their accounting systems uh, a little more streamlined. So working with businesses like Square um, to do things like that. Um, next slide, please, Vanessa. Um, so something that might be of interest to you guys is, uh, the evaluation process of the Jedi Zone. So the Jedi Zone program is uh, has been approved for five years um, and can be and is up for uh, evaluation to be extended for another five years after that five year period. Uh, but some things that we're we're going to be included in a report uh, back to council and the mayor's office uh, is the the number of new and relocating businesses in these Jedi Zones. Um, so we've done things such as um, develop uh, developing web pages or links to be able to identify vacant uh, storefronts or uh, or vacant buildings. Um, so 
any interested businesses um, or any businesses that are interested in taking advantage of the incentives or even just being uh, in the area that these Jedi zones are in, um, they could, they'll be able to locate and contact, and contact those leasing offices um, to learn more about being able to bring their business to that area. Um, Another thing that they're gonna be evaluated is the overall percentage of businesses helped within the Jedi zone. So just in terms of the number of businesses that are uh, actually engaging in the incentives that this program is offering. Um, another thing that's gonna be considered is the number of new jobs created in these zones. Um, so as we all know, if we're able to uh, make sure that the businesses are uh, flourishing and prospering as uh, with the incentives that we're offering, it will allow them to be able to expand and create more jobs for members of that community. Um, and last but not least, uh, another thing that's going to be evaluated is the number of pre-existing businesses in these participating Jedi zones. Um, so that number is going to more so be compared with the number of new businesses that we're able to bring in. Uh, but we also want to make sure that businesses that are already located in those Jedi zones aren't leaving or going out of business. Next slide. Um, so that concludes uh, my pre our presentation on our Jedi Zone uh, program and the incentives that are offered there. So I'll turn it back over to you, Mark, unless Vanessa has something to add. No, I just want to thank everyone. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Quasi and Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa, if you could please stop the share screen, please. Or I can. Got it. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much in, in that presentation. I definitely look forward to, um, and, and perhaps could one of you clarify, is there, is there like a, a and you, you have the five-year look backs as um, consideration of, of continuation for these. Will you have annual reports to highlight um, number of jobs generated and, and some of these key metrics? Absolutely. Um, every two years, we're going to report back to council, but those metrics that, that we in in-house are monitoring very closely. So I'm looking at those numbers at, at all times. Great, thank you very much. Look forward to uh, seeing some updates in the future as to the efficacy of this program. Uh, next, we'll have Garrett Ballard Rosa. He's going to introduce the Green Means Go program uh, to pilot, regional pilot throughout the Sacramento SACOG region in accelerating infill housing development, certainly a challenge that many of our communities face across California. Um, Garrett, please take it away. Look forward to this presentation. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Thanks so much for getting this together. And, and thanks to my fellow panelists. I'm really pleased to, to um, close this out. I'm a little jealous though, to follow the Jedi Zones. That That is a pretty awesome name. I know that was given to you by your council. We have, as you'll hear, Green Zones. So it does not quite the same, you know, Cache as Jedi Zone, but we're still really excited about um, what we're doing up here in Sacramento. So yeah, as Mark mentioned, my name is Garrett Balrosa. I'm the program manager for Green Means Go up here. And um, so at SACOG, the Sacramento Area Council of Governments, we're the regional entity. So you're, it's, it's great you're hearing about different scales in, in this webinar today and um, what we're doing in Green Means Go and working with our local partners. So for some, there we go. There's a little delay in advancing my slide. So, so again, it's it's a regional spin on on this place-based um, question we're all dealing with so closely. Pretty, you know, um, aspirational objectives in Green Means Go rooted in climate, rooted in um, equity, and rooted in the economy. Um, you know, I think we're optimistic in that we see, uh, you know, these these objectives about accelerating infill, reducing greenhouse gas um, emissions, and revitalizing our existing communities. Right? We we we're optimistic about progress because we see the alignment um, from state and federal goals from our own regional work, but of course, the alignment with the local um, projects and priorities. I'm gonna skip through this. Um, uh, I think one of the, just the key distinction from what you heard from City of LA with their Jedi zones about jobs, what we're talking about with Green Means Go and the Sacramento region is about housing. Of course, they're complementary you know, strategies, but um, I don't think we need to uh, um, show data. I'm gonna try to go quickly to leave time for questions about the need for housing. And for us the, the, in the Sacramento area, the key, the key um, barrier has been housing in an infill setting. So a lot of reasons why we um, have been thinking about Green Means Go for a couple of years. And so prior to what I'm pre presenting today about the program, it's, it's sort of informed by that, um, a lot of sort of stakeholder outreach. And again, a lot of the barriers to getting these housing and, and you know, economic development jobs in these infill areas, you can see on the screen, right? Um, what we really focused on and what you're gonna hear about in Green Means Go is the, the infrastructure needed to support it. 
not only the transportation side, but the non-transportation, the wet and dry utilities. Again, this is serving existing communities, right? The existing infrastructure might be outdated and definitely might not be um, sized to, to get the anticipation and density of uses that we want to see in these inflow areas. So again, a, a lot of challenges and I, you know, it's going to take a lot of partners to see more infill. We thought in Green Means Go, one role we could play at the regional level was thinking about the corridor-wide sort of infrastructure we needs to help get infill activated. Of course, this is just one example of you know how the regional program nests and is um, informed by local projects. Again, what, what are the challenges of getting infill in a, a region like ours in Sacramento, which is largely suburban in nature? Of course, it has rural aspects. Of course, it has you know, urban core, um, but it's largely suburban in nature. So I'm just going to show one example of a Green Means Go type project. This is the Sunrise Mall in Citrus Heights. So for those of you that don't know Citrus Heights, it's an inner, sub, inner ring suburb in Sacramento. Um, 100 acres, right? I think three quarters of it is surface parking, right? Really I mean, indicative of the changing nature of retail and the effect that will have on our existing communities, right? How does a sort of commercial corridor stay vibrant in the sort of a, a changing um, retail environment? So you know, Citrus Heights does a better job in this presentation. They start their presentation with like Sunrise Mall in the 90s and 2000s, right? Jam-packed, you know, it was the place to be. Sunrise Mall today, right? Obviously a very different dynamic, but they've gone through a lot of effort, a lot of community outreach, a lot of visioning about Sunrise tomorrow. So they have a specific plan in place, right? Um, just completely revisioning that, that site, that old mall, right? Into a great mix of uses, still has retail, still has a vibrant you know, retail. It has, it's coupled with commercial and office, and of course, then also with the housing at densities and at scales that, that you just haven't quite seen yet in the Sacramento region. Great vision, but of course, right, I'm sure you all know working at the local level and others, right, just the amount of challenge it will take from transitioning that vision into reality. So hopefully what we put together in Green Means Go can be an asset for the city and all of our partners in Sacramento region to having projects like this move forward. So that's all way of background. You might be saying, well, what? that's great background. What are you exactly talking about with Green Means Go? So Green Means Go is the program we put forward at SACOG. I'll talk about the criteria behind it. I'll talk about the green zone nomination. Our green zones, I think there's a lot of parallels to what you heard about from the Jedi zones. And I'll talk about some of the benefits of participating in the program. Again, the, the criteria behind it is kind of rooted in that barrier and problem identification, the market challenges for infill in our region, right? So um, in, in standing up this Green Means Go program, it's, it's solely focused on our infill areas, right? We're looking for areas that have capacity for housing because we know there's this underproduction of housing, especially in infill areas. We're looking for areas that have that local policy match, right? We'll be talking about funding in a second, but there's so much that can also be done by aligning policies to be more supportive of housing in infill areas. And then we think getting housing in these areas will also help reduce vehicle miles traveled or VMT, which is a, it's a co-benefit. But it's interesting, Al, when we were talking about criteria development, I, I um, uh, reflected on so many of our green zones, I think, are exhibiting the same types of characteristics as you might um, you might be seeing in the, in the Jedi zones. There's a data underpinning for what we did as well, but I think there's a strong overlap. You know, our promise zone is a green zone, opportunity zones are green zones. I, I, I just thought it was an interesting area or a, a observation of um, the criteria in developing these local place-based um, designations and how they overlap. So we, we asked all of our cities and counties, there's 28 of them up here in Sacramento, to, to locally nominate their own zones. Um, and then and then we asked their board or council to actually put forward a resolution. And then we went through that process using the criteria on the prior side um, to work through it. And we're pleased to say that 26 of the 28 jurisdictions um, have put forward and adopted a green zone. So that was the process of really trying to prioritize and focus on this place-based initiative, right? And getting the cities and counties to, to, to join us in partnership by actually going through that process of, of nominating and adopting those green zones. The benefits for participating in this, uh, we are fortunate enough to be able to be offering um, $35 million in funding solely targeted to these green zones. The, the uses of those funds come back to those, the, the areas I talked about in sort of problem um, and barrier sort of um, identification. So we're actually laser focused on this funding cycle on the non-transportation infrastructure, the sewer, the water, the wet and dry utilities, very much on a quarter wide scale how we could um, help uh, sort of um, right size or upsize that, that um, infrastructure investment to help make these um, corridors um, a lot more attractive for the, from the private development perspective. So the, the, the crux of the funding is going in this corridor wide infrastructure investment, but we know that there's still a lot of planning needs um, you know, uh, to get those corridors ready and pair that infrastructure capital investment with the right supportive planning policies. And then finally, 
we know that um, you know housing and, and infill take a long time. We were thinking about what are some early wins we could showcase to just help keep momentum around the region. So we're really pleased to have done a first cycle of awards this fall in November, about $3 million in that first category, the early implementation. Again, um, in these local place space, locally adopted green zones, it's a mix of planning and capital, but it actually lends more towards capital of getting some actual projects moving forward from an infrastructure side. And we're following that first cycle with um, 30 plus in, in 2023. So of course, funding has been a cornerstone of right, the benefits of participating in this, this local place-based place, um, place program. But uh, we've, we've tried to uh, pair that with some other um, sort of supportive efforts. We've been fortunate to partner with the Urban Land Institute or ULI to um, provide that technical assistance from ULI's perspective, the development um, and developer's perspective around what we'll take to activate these um, infill areas. And so we did four um, cycles of technical assistance this fall to a kind of in a more rural setting, looking at specific sites in some sort of small town rural areas, what would it take to get into housing there? And then two in a more suburban setting, looking at more corridor wide um, questions about activating those corridors. So ULI has done their interviews, they've done their site um, visits and they're working on their recommendations. So we're excited to get those recommendations out to our partners um, come early 2023. And then finally, um, we've noticed that since our focus has been on that sort of corridor wide infrastructure, a, a partner that we, weren't necessarily thinking about upfront, but it's been really important to, to actually um, engage stronger with are the infrastructure providers. And it, it differs by community, but a lot of our communities um, uh, are, are not full service jurisdictions. A lot of the infrastructure provided by special districts are working. We're trying to work closer with our sewer and water and utility districts around infill. And we just had a convening last week, which is the first one we might have done in our region about um, infrastructure and you. Um, the, the sort of overlap between cities, counties, special districts, and the regional agency um, in the context of fees. So again, our program sort of still in the infancy this is the first year we've stood it up. So I think we're still reflecting on lessons learned. Um, just some of my key takeaways um, right now is um, it was really important for us before we even were able to um, move forward with that fund go, right? If we were fortunate to get future funding is going towards greening go. So there was a commitment before we even had the funding that, that um, we would be moving forward with this program. And if we were lucky enough to secure that funding, it was already locked in place. So I think it helped demonstrate to our partners, right? Um, the momentum behind Greenings go. And it helped as well for us to stand up this funding program that our board had already weighed in on its objectives. Um, I'll maybe skip to the third one you see on the screen, right? Of course, it's easy to get some momentum um, and buy-in when there's funding, right? All of a sudden you, you say there's 35 million in funding available. Uh, you know, People are quicker to, to respond to your emails and return your calls. So of course funding always helps, but we've also found that you know just getting the program up and running, that momentum builds upon itself. I talked about the funding. I talked about the complementary efforts through ULI and the convening. Those last two, the ULI efforts and the convening, weren't actually part of our, our um, sort of scope for the first year of Green Means Go, where laser focused on the funding, but those opportunities presented themselves. It's kind of like, you know, you, you get it rolling and these new opportunities present themselves. So we were able, we we're um, fortunate enough to be able to complement the funding with those other things. We thought it made for our, sort of a richer program. Um, and so it just sort of goes to show up. Sometimes you just gotta get started, right? And then more and more opportunities um, build up itself. So wanted to go through that pretty quick. I know I can talk quick, but I wanted to make sure that I left time um, that um, I'm really curious to see um, what questions there are from the participants for, for myself and my fellow panelists. So Mark, I'll turn it back to you. Oh, and I should say, um, contact information, please reach out if you have any questions. Great, thank you very much, Garrett. Um, really excited about that program, especially of some of the unexpected benefits of getting you know this technical panel from ULI to come do some studies to help these jurisdictions really um, leverage uh, other uh, existing programs and what they can do to align them themselves by policies, uh, infrastructure investments to really be able to uh, further leverage this program. Um, and that also, you know, it's it's a great example of the type of work we're trying to do, try, type of work that we're trying to highlight and emulate across the state is how can we take these small investments at a local level, at a regional level, turn them to something greater with the state and at federal uh, federal layering. So that's uh, definitely uh, some something that would want to make sure it's it's iterated through this um, session. Is you know what are ways that you can take these uh, these small initiatives and turn them into something greater? Um, so we'll stick around for a few minutes. I know we've had some questions that have come through my um, myself and my panelists. We've been able to respond to them. Um, please, if you have additional questions, 
shoot them in the Q&A. Um, we'll be happy to um, respond to them, either myself or my panelists, depending on who that question be targeted to. Um, so we'll wait just a couple more minutes. And um, I do see, I believe, a hand raised. I will, uh, Danette Martin, I'm going to open up to, oh, sorry, you, you unraised hand. I see your hand raised. I'm going to uh, press allow to talk. So please go ahead and um, share the question you have. Um, my question was for the team who spoke from um, Los Angeles. And I wanted to get a little bit of insight into how they are making um, the businesses within the Jedi zones aware of the incentives that are available to them and what type of technical assistance do they provide to those small um, businesses to take advantage of those incentives? Hi, Danette. Great questions. Thank you very much. Um, the incentives are directly marketed. We have done door-to-door -door marketing. Um, we have also conducted um, what's called orientations, which are just scheduled events. We found that um, business owners are usually not as receptive to uh, disruption of their operations by us just walking in, in their, into their uh, spaces. So um, we have um, done mailers. We um, are also interested now in procuring an organization or several agencies or organizations that can assist us in these outreach efforts. Um, the uh, main thing right now is for us to get the word out and to notify these um, businesses that are already approved and eligible for all of the Je Jedi Zone incentives, um, how to take advantage of them. And then the second question about the technical assistance, um, there, are, um, there are program managers that we have in-house in economic and workforce development department that are assigned to each JEDI zone. Those program managers are um, directly responsible for coordinating those benefits and incentives for um, each of the businesses. So there is a lot of, um, interaction between the program manager and the and the uh, affected business. Um, additionally, though, the city has um, business source centers, which uh, around the city, there are about, I believe, nine or 10 business source centers um, that are contractors who are specifically um, paid by the city to provide no cost um, technical assistance to businesses citywide. Does that answer your questions? Thank you, Vanessa. That was very helpful to understand. Um, and just one last question. I noticed when I looked at the, um, the um, Jedi zones that you highlighted in the presentation or your colleague highlighted that one looks like it, uh, it overlaps with the South Los Angeles Promise Zone, which is called Slate Z. It does. Uh, is there one that also overlaps with the Los Angeles Promise Zone? It and does. My follow-up question is, have you given presentations to both of those Promise Zones about these opportunities? Because I know each one of them has different types of economic development activities they're engaged in. Okay. Um, thank you for your questions. Um, the first question that you had was um, whether it overlaps with the Slate Z, and I can assure you that it does, um, and whether we have one in the other um, Promise Zone in South LA. Um, we are evaluating three additional areas in South LA right now um, in Council District 8, which um, is the same um, area that I can't remember what the name of that promise zone is it's what what is the name of that promise zone? there's the now? slate z promise zone which is in south la and then there's the los angeles promise zone which is more in north um east la and i was trying to find out whether you have jedi zones in both of their um their footprint i guess so there's only one established and that's the one in the slate z but i do believe that the boundaries of the other promise zone um we are evaluating for a jedi zone right now 
Um, so it has yet to be approved. Um, and as Kwesi um, mentioned, we have those secondary um, criteria that they have to meet and exceed in order to, to, to be designated as a JEDI zone. Thank you so much. No problem. Just from a follow-up on that as a curiosity question, of the JEDI zones that have been adopted, how many of them, right, roughly were from the primary criteria and how many of them were um, more because they met the secondary criteria? Do you have any sense of like how that fell down? Yeah, sure. I, I got this one. Okay. Um, that, that's a great question. So in when in order to even begin an, an evaluation as a JEDI zone, you have to meet that primary criteria. So you have to already be designated as one of those other um, opportunity zones, promise zones. Um, you have to have that designation in order to even make it to the secondary evaluation. And that secondary evaluation allows us to kind of take um, an, an entire opportunity zone, which is a census tract, and focus in on the area that is most needy or most underserved. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Vanessa, I think just to touch on that, I think it was established or in the policy, right, in the, on the, uh, the last primary qualification is if it meets four of the uh, secondary, it can be considered as well, right? That is correct. So if in fact there is no prior designation of an area, um, in other words, it has not been nominated as an opportunity zone or promise zone, uh, it's not nominated in our citywide economic development strategy, it's not an EIFD or CREA, um, then you can still request evaluation of an area, but it has to, that our evaluation is going to be of those secondary needs criteria, and if it meets four of those, then it still can be established as the JEDI zone. Thank you, Kwesi. Sorry, I'm just re responding to some in the, uh, some questions by uh, chat. Um, we do have one a question from Christina Wyatt that I want to bring, and it it's it may be one that I, I could have some support perhaps from Eric Yost. Um, it uh, the question arrived during your presentation, and Christina Wyatt asks, "Can you please help define underserved, i.e." How can San Benito County with a population approximately 65,000 be further recognized and supported as the feeder housing for Silicon Valley, bootstrapped with housing? Um, some of this I may need some assistance in uh, spelling out what, what you mean. Um, HHS, our special district hospital is Chapter 9 bankrupt. 65% of our workforce commutes outside of the county on a two-lane highways under concurrent construction of roundabouts. Thank you. So. Um, I am going Great. to, yeah, yeah there's I, mul mul multiple I tiers of this question. Part of that, and I think it goes to exactly what Garrett and, and um, Vanessa and, and Queasy were, were sharing is, you know, every program has their own definitions. They even may use the same term, but have different definitions. And that's what makes place-based so unique is understanding criteria and terms. You know, it's interesting in the work that we're doing for the rural partners network, right? So that's for the um, for that place-based initiative, um, federal interagency place-based initiative. Something that came up, and we our rural prosperity coordinating council at HUD is we are looking at all the multitude of definitions of rural in HUD. Like we do not have a single definition of rural at HUD. We have multiple definitions and they change from year to year and grant program to grant program. And so even asking that simple question, which was a, a very um, pointed question of what is an underserved community, um, it's interesting. We had a discussion about this yesterday with our policy development and research team because through the White House executive order on underserved communities, there's a definition, but it doesn't provide the criteria and the data for that. So exactly what Vanessa and Garrett were sharing in Kwesi was like each program may have their own criteria around that, even though there's a, a definition that you need. And that's why I started with definitions because I think it become really important and each program can have multiple definitions around that. And even underserved can have a broader definition but you have to look at specifically to qualify for a program, how is that being defined? 
And I think that's how place-based initiatives have historically and place-based policies have been approached is to how do you, how do we create some criteria and some framework around picking that place and drawing that boundary as, as was shared by our participants. And just like we do in the federal government, you know, it can be proved challenging because what about someone that's across the street? What about people that, move, you know, are working in that place? But that's the nature of place-based initiative. And I always say that is just, there is a defined boundary most of the time and you have to meet criteria to qualify. And it, and it varies. And so um, one thing we're doing across the federal government, especially with the executive order on equity, is we're looking at not only when we're thinking about um, supporting place-based initiatives or work in communities, is balancing that high, high capacity communities um, with those that have lower capacity but high need, right? And so I think those are some of the things that I think Vanessa and Queasy were sharing is when you look at their data and criteria for the Jedi zones, I was really impressed with that because it brought in multiple aspects to consider. It wasn't just, you have to meet one, two, three, and if you don't, you're out. There was like multiple layers to the process of selecting. And I'm sure Garrett, for yours, you went through those similar processes for, for your initiative. And I think that's what we're looking at more now is how do we not create definitions that exclude the people that we're really trying to serve but we also have competitive processes to either apply or provide it. And so that's always the challenge. And as much as we can provide that feedback to communities to have input, that always helps. Um, so, you know, we do things in the federal government through the federal register, but most people probably don't subscribe to that to say, hey, I should comment on this. So we try and get the word out if we are designing a new program. Good question. And thank you, Eric, because communities that are under-resourced, we don't have the people to have the data even be at the table to ask for the resources. And we're at the process of updating our comprehensive economic development strategy, connecting with the EDA, the USDA. Our, our community has bootstrapped the development and growth of Silicon Valley, and it's been to our detriment. Our broadband, our roads, health and human resources, our, our special district hospital is facing a uh, chapter nine bankruptcy. We have so much opportunity, so much um, ways that we could leverage our inability or um, resource constraints to take advantage of programs like what you were discussing today. We just need to know where we can invest and put resources to ask for that kind of support. So any kind of um, recommendations are greatly appreciated. And thanks to Brian Coleman for from GoBiz to inviting us to the table today. Thank you. I would say, you know, one of the, the interesting challenges and in reflecting back on some of the research that I shared up front, and I'm sure that that our, our partners here on the call are facing is how do you make sure you invest in those places like Christina, what you're sharing, because it is capacity constrained. We introduced an initiative. We want you to participate in your capacity constraint to apply or to actually do it. So how can we provide resources to either have someone that you can hire, build a backbone, or how do we support that? And those are those ongoing discussions we're having quite a lot of in the past. We've always said, hey, we'll give you someone to help you. But we, what we haven't said is, we'll give you money to help you to hire someone to do that. And I think that's that's where, you know, and train that person and get them on board and partner with that person. And I think that's where some of the, at least on the federal side, we're starting to think about that a lot more where we haven't been able to fund that into our program design is how do we build in getting some staff added to your team rather than us just coming and saying, designate people to help us. <laughs> so Absolutely. And we're happy to kind of partner with you and absolutely prove that we're accountable to the public resources that are invested in our community. Thank you. And we'll, uh, from Gobi's perspective, we'll ensure that um, Brian continues to be engaged with you uh, in ensuring that you're uh, becoming more involved at, at regional um, and state levels. Um, it, we are at time now. Um, I do appreciate everybody's participation, my panelists' participation in this, showcasing the programs. Um, that they work on that they've developed or helped develop and are deploying across the state. Um, special thanks also to Eric Yost, providing an update on federal place-based initiatives and research. Certainly a lot of literature that was mentioned. Um, many of us, I'm sure we would like to dig into that to learn more about some best practices that we can uh, exercise within our own jurisdictions. Um, as I mentioned, this is ideal. We're gonna, we're gonna turn this into a regular um, program, so something we want to do on a quarterly basis. So encourage those in the audience to come engaged with their regional economic recovery coordinator uh, that we have at GoBiz um, so that you can help us um, identify 
you know, what is going on at the regional level, what you're doing at the regional level and place-based programming so we can highlight and continue this best practices, community practice. So I appreciate everybody's um, participation and all the attendees for sticking with us for this hour and a half uh, for this program. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.